Hey there, I'm Tim. And I'm Louisa. And we're two movie lovers here to show our appreciation to those people in the credits that make a film extraordinary. That's right. This is a podcast centered around young upcoming talent whose tremendous dedication allowed them to shine in this crazy town. This is Hollywood Rising. Hey, Louisa, how you doing? Hi, Tim. I'm doing great. How about you? Very good. Um, wow, you're kind of in my personal space right now. <laughs> Same. That's fine. I hope you brush and floss. <laughs> Every day. All right. Well, today we are doing uh, the director segment of our podcast, Hollywood Rising, and you'll be pleased to know I know exactly what a director does already. Oh, really? Yeah. They. Can, can you walk me through it? Absolutely. They point at stuff. They tell people what to do a lot, and then they just, you know, they go to lunch or whatever they do. So, Are they the ones that, that, that yell cut? They, they probably yell cut okay. once in a while. Okay. Um, so that an action. Uh, an action, yeah. So that concludes our podcast. So oh, everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> Have a great weekend. <laughs> no, I am here to introduce a director duo, uh, two young guys up and coming. Joe Deitch and Louis Gibson are here today. How are you guys doing? Hello. Good. How are you? Thanks Very good. Us. Good, good. So we'd like to start off with an overview question. Uh, in your own words, what what does a film director do? What we do, I can't speak to what every type of a director does. I think what we do is we write the projects, we conceive the project, and then as the director, you're there to oversee all of the elements of production and make sure that they come together with a cohesive vision. Because you can have a bunch of talented people on set, but if everyone is working biopically in their own part of that set and there's not one person who's sort of trying to see what the movie needs to look like when it comes out the other end of the sausage grinder, uh, things can work well on their own but not come together into the final product in, in yeah. simple terms. Was that answer correct, Louis? Yes. Okay. Correct. <laughs> it's being the captain. I mean, yeah, it's being the captain and, you know, like what Joe was saying, we usually, you know, if we're lucky, we can write our own um, stories. And if we get to make them, then uh, it's just trying to, you know, help that story get told. And obviously, you know, yeah, working with all departments and um, actors. It's cohesion. I think it's, you know, it's a lot of knowing when to step in and when to stand back. You know, when mm -hmm. to let people have their space to also create because the director is not the only person on set. Mm -hmm. You know, you're – I think for us, when we write a project, I would say that script is ours. Like whatever we put down there is the story we wanted to tell that belongs to us. But then you cast a movie and the story belongs to the actors. You know, you're letting them play those characters and you're bringing on other people who have a vision and whether that's, you know, in – post-production sound or special effects, you're bringing people together who have their own vision of what their contribution can be. And you kind of need to have your vision, but also know how to support them. Because it's at some point, it's, it doesn't, it's not something you own anymore, you know, so it's sort of knowing when to turn that over. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's about being collaborative. We're not like um, coming in as dictators, you know, and saying, you have to do this and this. I mean, people have, you have to listen to other people's input. I mean, ultimately, it's going to be us who get to kind of make that final decision. But like he was saying, I mean, especially with actors, you know, we've had so many experiences where they could come in and, you know, the scene starts going, they're playing around and um, it comes out so much different, you know, differently than we might have even seen it on the page and it's better. So uh, you have to leave space for that. I was, it always sticks stuck with me. Uh, it was Anthony Hopkins talking about acting and he was saying he liked Ridley Scott as a director because Ridley Scott only told him faster or slower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins is like, yeah, I'm an actor. Like, I know how to act. Like, mm -hmm. you need me to walk into the room faster. Like, let me know. But like, that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Don't tell me how to how to well, do my job. I won't tell you how yeah. to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's actually the certain people who you kind of maybe will hold your tongue a little bit on. Yeah, like he was saying on performance stuff like that, because they know. Yeah, they're gonna know what to do. They're not telling us how to do our job. So. Um, as long as it comes across, then we're happy. Now, more than uh, more than ever, having two directors on a project is is common. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys find that working together is is a, a pretty smooth process? You can't collaborate with everyone. You have to find. You know, it's a relationship. Essentially, we were joking about it earlier. I was saying, like, 
and I say this, it's like we're in a marriage, essentially. Like, we see each other sometimes more than or as much as each other's wives. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, we, you know, I feel like even if we're not together, we're probably talking on the phone every day about whatever a project is or something we're working on or the next thing. So we collaborate really well. We don't really step on each other's toes. And I think we kind of tend to leave ego at the door. If someone, whether it's in the, even in the writing process, if we're sending, because we usually write separately and we'll have, you know, folders we send back and forth and do drafts on. If, you know, we don't get our feelings hurt if someone's like, hey, I'm going to scrap half this and do this. And, you know, we may have like a conversation back and forth about it, but it's never, it's whoever's idea is the best is going to win out. And no one's heard about that because in the end of the day, it's about making the best product. So I think that's kind of how I would say we look at yeah, all of it. It's a, yeah, the, the collaboration question is a weird one to me because I haven't collaborated as a director ever with anyone other than, than Louis. Mm. So it's not something where I can compare my you know, experiences of like uh, this. Like I think there would be challenges if I tried to do that with other people. Mm-hmm. But with us, it's always worked. So it's not something that a lot of thought has to go into of like how does it work it just it just does i think i think it's also our sensibilities we share a lot of the same sensibilities you know it's a lot of fun we work off each other so um yeah i guess yeah like i've had people in the past early on who would be like hey i'm a writer you're a writer we should let's go write something and i would be like well what do you like you know how do you know we're gonna work together and uh, i think for a lot of people like it, it wouldn't work so it just does for us somehow (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, you wouldn't be doing the second movie together mm-hmm. if yeah. it didn't work out the first time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's not to count the other 90% of projects we've worked on that yeah. have all failed oh, and aren't, aren't failed movies. And, so. <laughs> and scripts sitting in folders that yeah, – Mostly you know. we fail. It's yeah. just like, a, it's like a, we, we like fail a lot and then every couple of years a movie like we got lucky comes twice. out the other end. You know. Uh, so you mentioned the way we do things. Could you please share a little bit about your creative process as a duo from the moment you get an idea to the moment you start filming a project? I think I can take the first part of that. I think that coming up with an idea, I think it, it's very hard to sit. I don't think it's hard, but I don't think it's a good use of energy to sit down and say, today we're, you're going to come up with an idea and that'll be what your movie is. You, <laughs> you kind of have to like recognize when an idea floats by and grab it. And then even then, I would say we sit on an idea for a while, mm-hmm. usually, because you can have an idea and it's exciting when you first have it. And then you sit down and you outline it and it gets a little less exciting. And then you start writing it and it's a little less exciting. And then you're like, oh, we're going to live with this thing for like three years. Like, no, like mm-hmm. scrap it. Yeah. I mean, we have like we're, for instance, we're in the middle of writing something right now that was a concept that was thought of and then it was one of those things that sits in a folder and then you pull it out oh that's cool and like maybe a year like probably a year later more than it's like we should look at that um and then you outline it and then you know if it works if it clicks everything's got to click sometimes we'll go through that outline process and you think it's all going to work and then you get into it and it just it doesn't feel right so we have you know we have plenty of things like that that are in some form of finished or, you know, outline form or half done. And if it's not feeling right, you kind of step away from it, go for something else that excites you. We just have to be excited by it. Mm -hmm. I think it's the discipline, too, of sometimes being able to recognize when an idea is half an idea. Mm -hmm. There's ideas that it's like this is, a you know, it's a genuinely interesting idea. But if you're outlining it and it's not working, you know, maybe it's maybe it's half an idea and you got to let it sit until the other half kind of floats along. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, When you actually start how rigorously do you do you stick to the script while you're shooting? I think we – I mean we usually stick to pretty close to what it is as far as, you know, minus any production stuff. If we get into it and we're like, well, we're not going to shoot in a diner because we – you know, we're going to go – any of that stuff. But as far as like the scenes and um, how they fit together, the only thing that I would think that would really change is maybe if we're in a setting and it's not working or an actor wants to try something else and we decide – that, but otherwise, I mean, we start, you know, we try to stick pretty close. Mm-hmm. I would say. I think the reality of the sort of modern production model for most movies, which is where you're shooting in about 20 days, maybe 20 days and change, if you're lucky, is you don't really have the freedom to try something off script because if you're trying something off script, it better work. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you just lost a day that you didn't really yeah. have. The necessity of how we've shot. Our first two movies, our first movie being uh, Happy Hunting, came out in 2017, and our new movie being Manifest West that's currently wrapping up uh, post-production. Both movies were just, you know, on a budget, and 
you had a set number of days and, you know, there's not really the time to sort mm-hmm. of say, hey, today we're just going to, you know, improv this and see if it works. That's also not to say, though, that we're always tweaking dialogue up until we shoot it, like, a lot of the time. So, like, we could be get in the morning and him if him and I are there and we're setting up, we might look at stuff and, you know, move some stuff around. But once we're shooting, if it's working, we're, you know, moving and grooving. <laughs> <laughs> What was the hardest artistic choice you've made in the making of any film you worked on? <laughs> oh, my God. God. Um, Pick one. <laughs> Pick one. Yeah, the hardest one. <laughs> the hardest choice. I don't know that it comes down to there, – there wasn't, like, one, like, gut-wrenching choice where, you know, you had to, like, make the call on something. I think it's a lot of – you write a script, you have something in your head, and it's the process of, you know – Getting to set, being on a location, whatever that location is on that day is what it is. Like if the sky's a certain way or the wind's blowing or like whatever it is, mm-hmm. that's going to be what that scene is. And it's letting go of the idea of it doesn't really matter what you wrote is you got the cast there, you got the crew there, you're going to shoot that scene. And at the end of the day, whatever you shot is going to be what the scene is. And if that wasn't how you pictured it, tough, you know, that's mm-hmm. it's just what it is <laughs> at that point. Um, so I think it's it's rolling with that on a daily basis is sort of this the, the constant ongoing struggle. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it throws yeah. you a lot of variables. Yeah, you just always have to try to make it work. Do you find it easier or more difficult to wear? I mean, because you guys do a lot of stuff on your movies. Um, you wear a lot of hats. Is it easier to do that or is it more difficult? Just make it more difficult and more work. I like control. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think there's an aspect that's nice about the control, especially if we've taken something from the page and we can go in um, and shoot it and then we can get in, you know, to the edit and be like, oh, we have like the freedom to, you know, um, do what we want here. Uh, I think there's also an aspect of, I mean, the last couple projects we did were definitely a smaller crew size. So we did have to wear more hats and... There's something about that that sometimes I think can be good in that um, you get to really be in the world. You get to kind of go in and you get to see it from all angles, you know, as far as, you know, just every aspect of it. So I don't know. It's kind of I think it puts you in the headspace more like you're fully in it. Um, But that obviously isn't always the case. If you're on something much bigger, you got to have, you know. A larger crew, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I think for a little context, it was on our, our first movie, Happy Hunting. Um, we wrote it. We were the directors. I was the cinematographer. We also edited it. Uh, on that one, Louis ran sound. I ran days. sound, and it was bad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was my biggest artistic regret. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be silly if you guys actually did the foley or something, but oh, the we foley. Yeah. We've, done, we've, we've done a we lot of foley. foley. <laughs> I don't know if all of it got used by uh, 424, but um, it probably got I think, uh, I think a good amount of it did. Um, it's, yeah, it's about creating the world. I don't know. Like, and I think that's a big part of Post so, as well. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I think that I would say for, for me, I think running sound on the first movie is tough. Sound is a very technical thing on set, mm-hmm. and it's not really putting you in the creative space. But for me, working as a director and a DP on stuff has, has never been particularly an issue uh, because I think when you're – looking through the camera and you're setting the shot, you're still sort of doing what the director does. You're still mm-hmm. engaged in the scene. Whereas, you know, if you're if you're recording sound, it's like you're listening for airplanes and stuff. That That's, has yeah, nothing that, to do yeah, with that, what the movie That definitely is. took me out of it a little bit for sure on that. And um – I mean, that's why it was good. There were two of us. Um, the good thing on Happy Hunting is there's like 45 minutes of that guy walking around the desert no with no one talking. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's a it's a largely MOS movie. Yeah. For, that was just filling out like a killer sound mix and yeah. um, all that. Yeah. To totally immerse yourself in every step, every part of the process, though, it just seems like it'd be exhausting. And you could – I would think it could be easy to lose the energy – you know, what, especially when you're in post and be like, oh, my God, I spent so much of my life on this movie and mm-hmm. I'm ready to check out. I would say Happy Hunting, way less so than Manifest, this Manifest West, the last movie that we're just finishing up post on, um, was definitely more exhausting by the end. Like halfway through the shoot, we were pretty beat because it was legitimately – sometimes it was Joe and I on set with just the actors and that was it. So uh, obviously we had a, you know, producer – but sometimes he wasn't there because he was dealing with every other logistical thing. Um, so we didn't have to deal with it. Um, one thing we couldn't do on set, like we can't be doing the 
producer role on set because you just never you'd never be able to really focus on it. But yeah, that was much more, I would say, exhausting. I'm sure. I mean, I know you were exhausted on by the end of that, too. Yeah. That, I mean, that was a physically very challenging shoot. I think our, our new movie was less. So we were mostly up in a single cabin for mm-hmm. the majority of the movie and shooting in the woods surrounding yeah. the cabin. I think, I mean, I would say one thing we've done to make it easy on ourselves is we've always used a lot of natural light. Mm-hmm. Um, usually our lighting package is one HMI yeah. and some, you know, little battery lights we can fly around if we need. Uh, Happy Hunting, I think the majority of it was just no lights. I think we had the yeah. HMI out for like a couple of days. Our Manifest West, we had the HMI up most every day. But, you know, if you're giving yourself any more work to do on lighting than that with, with you know, a limited crew, you're you're in trouble. I think that's really smart. I mean, those movies look like they look consistently very good. I mean, <laughs> the way they're photographed feels like you used what's there and, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're pretty efficient that way. Mm-hmm. I always laugh. There's a picture of, I think it was from one of the Mission Impossible movies on set and it's it's Tom Cruise, the DP, and the uh, uh, director and they're standing there, you know, shooting with natural light. The DP has the camera handheld and there's three of them and they're just in an alley with no lights and behind them, you know, there's 600 other people. <laughs> but... At the end of the day, the only thing that ended up on camera was what the three of them did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've always looked at it as like if we had the 600 people standing around, we'd probably still be doing it how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We just have better craft services. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I I, I would say on Happy Hunting for what we pulled off as far as, you know, the time we had and the amount of coverage we had to get, it probably would have only worked the way we did it crew size wise because if we would have had even a 20 person crew would have just slowed things down. We had hundreds no hundred setup days. Yeah, like we were like that. just going handheld, just running around a desert on the salt flats. Let's get this. We got, you know, we're just like pointing the camera and getting what we needed to. So um Happy Hunting was it was a little more like being kids with a camera, running around yeah. shooting stuff, kind of making stuff up as you go, trying stuff out. Mm-hmm. I think our you know, it was manifest West, we, yeah. we did like twenty five setups a day and we yeah. had a crew and it, you know, it was wow. a little bit more of a that was a growing yeah. up movie. I mean, yeah, the, you know, talking about photographing, and we also decided to, we barely went handheld. We we had it on tripods. It's full. You know, we we're shooting pages of dialogue, so we could light it, we could set it, we could sit in the house, um, and just you know, some days it would just be let's just get this conversation scene, um, which on Happy Hunting was definitely not the case. Yeah, how many setups? Uh, Happy, Happy Hunting, Hunting, we were doing hundred setup days. Sometimes oh, Manifest yeah. West was trying to average about twenty five. <laughs> yeah, we were pretty worn out. <laughs> One thing we've done that's, I think, been helpful to us that I would recommend, free plug for Canon, is uh, we've always shot our movies on Canons because it's a real workhorse camera. The batteries last for three hours. Uh, Mm -hmm. Still looks good. New movie's still 4K raw. You know, um, it's a great, it's a great image, but it's not a diva as a camera. Yeah. Um, You don't need a bunch of ACs. It doesn't require a lot of you. It's kind of just there and it works. Uh, So the second part of that question is, what's your favorite part of the process? Hmm. I think think editing, honestly. Not after like three months of editing, but I think I like (laughs) sitting down after it's done and having it because that's when you get to play with it and see it. I mean, ultimately, I think hopefully people are making movies that they would want to watch. So that's kind of the part where you get to watch it, you know. Yeah. See the scenes come together and you don't have to lift the lights and do the sort of physical labor in the long days and any of that. It's just sort of right there in front of you. Yeah. Um, I would you know, hate to turn over the editing part of the process to someone else, which I assume at some point in our careers we're going to have to do. But it's been enjoyable to be able to cut our own movies. Yeah. We, I mean, yeah, we've had a lot of control on the last couple films, which was great. Uh, there was no one really breathing down our neck too hard uh, in that. I, I think it's um, – the editing process for sure, like especially if, if we've written it and then you're really getting to see a scene play out and it's and it's working, it's like that's amazing. If everyone's like on the ball and it's on point, the actors are doing it, and especially when it surprises you and it just like comes off the page and works even better. There were certain, you know, there's certain scenes where it's like you come out like on a high for sure off that. What if you're watching it and you're missing a shot that you absolutely need? That happens sometimes. <laughs> Go back and get an insert or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, got to do some pickups. Yeah. Both of our movies definitely have uh, a lot of insert shots. Not a lot, but like a few insert shots in my office mm-hmm. here and there. <laughs> yeah, that you can, I mean. You would never know. Surprises but. the shit out of me when sometimes when, yeah, you can fake something. You're like, you know, something was night in a room and then 
you're like, we got to get that. And then you go into color and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, it matches. Like it looks like we were in the same room, but, you know, different table, Louis different done room. done some hand doubling. Yeah. Ask her. You see my hands. <laughs> <laughs> now that you guys have worked for, for a while, do you have any common themes or commentaries um, behind your films um, or any like issues that you want to bring awareness to? I mean, one th I think a commonality I would say between Happy Hunting and Manifest West is that if I had to ascribe a genre to them, I would say they're both westerns. You watch Happy Hunting, it's a it's a horror movie, but it's kind of a western. You know, it's playing with themes of the American western and all that. And then Manifest West is uh, very much playing with in that space, but it's but it's still sort of a dark family drama. You know, so it, it's not a classic, you know, there's not guys with spurs and cowboy hats walking around town, but it's still playing with the themes of the American Western. So I think our two movies so far have kind of both been been Westerns that were pretending to be something else. Mm -hmm. Do you just kind of fall into that as you're writing? Like, do you find that you have similar structures to your uh, stories or similar uh, undertones? I, I think that there, to me, the, the Western genre, whether again, whether or not you got the guys with, with the cowboy hats and the spurs, it's always a very appealing genre. Um, I think that you had, you know, you look back into the 40s, you had this sort of classical Jimmy Stewart American Westerns, where it was the good guys, the bad guys, and it was sort of a morality play. But then at some point, you had the Italians come along and make Westerns. The Italians weren't particularly interested in what the American experience was. So they made spaghetti Westerns, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all, mm -hmm. you know, all of those movies, which were just sort of taking the West as a playground to have crazy stories happen. In this kind of space where there's not rules and there's sort of, you know, this a different code and, you know, how do you, like, take that space and tell interesting stories within it? So I think that's sort of what the appeal of that genre is to me is, you know, this this world where the rules exist but not exactly and kind of what, what kind of characters and stories can you have that exist at this, like, fringe within that space. So mm -hmm. That's funny. Western does – the genre kind of covers a lot of ground. What's one thing you wish you had known at the beginning of your career? Louis Sleepwalks. Oh, oh, but between each other, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sleepwalk. We were in Korea for. Uh, I don't know if we want to segue into this. Oh, let's go. It's a good story. Yeah, I, I yeah, I sl sometimes I sleepwalk and I'll do strange <laughs> things. And when we went, we went to um, Habiante went to Bucheon, um, and so we played at the festival out there. We went out to South Korea, and um, Joe and I shared a room. And I just had a baby, like I had like a two week old baby, and I went out to this festival, and I was like so in the mind state of. Having this baby that like two, I think it was two, maybe three nights in a row. Uh, Joe woke up. I thought that uh, I thought he was my kid. What? what no. no. Oh no, no. I thought, know what it was. I you thought, thought his your kid pillow, was inside my pillowcase. Okay, I thought the pillow under his head was my son for some reason. I was all like, <laughs> like tweaked <laughs> out. Like, I'm and, trying to steal my. And pillows. I went and he was like ah, and then I was like ah, and I go and then it happened again a second night and he woke up. He was like. Ah, get away from me. And I was like, ah, I just like screamed and ran away. <laughs> oh, my God. So, anyway, I, I, yeah, I got to – if I'm like – I don't know what it is. When I'm in new places, I'll sleepwalk. So, <laughs> so I've learned that. Uh, <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> One thing we knew about – or just in general? Just in general. Um, I think it was a more intellectual question than I made out to be. I guess I, I'm trying to think of the right word for it. But I think we learned to be realistic about expectations of other people because – you go into meetings, you go into rooms, like early on, you kind of just are like, you know, someone will be like, yeah, we're going to do, you know, they kind of just give you their speech and you start to realize everyone gives you the same speech. Um, and uh, I don't, don't want to be cynical, but I think we just, I guess the word is, I would say it's more uh, just realistic about it, just a realist about like, okay, maybe not to get too excited about something until it's happening because a lot of stuff falls through. Mm -hmm. Be smart when you're, you know, when you're creating a project, you know, have, have the people who you trust you know, we've had uh, friends Bryson Pintard and Joe Toronto were producers on our last uh, two movies. You know, they're people who we've worked with for a bunch of years. We trust those guys. But, you know, it's a thing where you're you're creating a project and your script's done. You start talking to people. People say, oh, I can take it over here. And then suddenly that person's attached on the project. Yeah. And you you create this clown car eventually where, you know, there's – I think that was – we had we scripts had a, yeah. before Happy Hunting that were unproduced that just kept attracting producers. And at some point you're going into a meeting and there's like eight people who want to be in the meeting. And, <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, it's you, completely you, untangible. Yeah, you, it's not You tangible. just sort of need to not bring people into the fold because filmmaking is a collaborative process. But you, when you're, you're sort of self-generating content, you have to be smart about how those attachments work mm -hmm. because if you – bog down a project out the gate, it's just never going to take off. 
um, there's just, you're creating issues for yourself. So I think that's something we've been aware of increasingly, you mm-hmm. know, because we, we learned that the hard way. What's one common myth about what you do that you would like to debunk today? I don't know. That's a, it's an, it's an interesting question. I just, um, Trying to think what a myth about we're nice. I don't know. Being director, we're, not, <laughs> we're, we're not dickheads. We are. <laughs> some some are. You hear stories. Uh, I guess. Not yet. I mean, I would say that's uh, like a myth in general about the film industry that I would that I fa- I found not to be true is that you know it's this sort of like hard boiled you know everyone's you'll never work in this town again and you know that that sort of mentality and generally. People are very nice. Mm-hmm. Everyone's working, and people people will tell you things that aren't true, you know, and will try to sort of make themselves out to be something other than what they are. But I, I think that's true of any industry. And yeah. really, in general, I found it to be much more friendly and collaborative than than you know this sort of Shark Tank mentality. Yeah, you just gotta. I mean, I don't know. I think we have a. I would say we have a decent radar for you know, um, for like sharks, you know, just for people who. Or like that, but yeah, I mean, we've They're had, we've had it, has, it hasn't been my, but, that, hasn't but that's, been my but that's every business, I would say, where you there's know, money. I think some, you know, film gets a bad rap as being somehow worse than other businesses, and it, it's just, I think, the same. If you were on this side of the mic, what would you have asked yourself that we didn't ask you today? What'd you eat for lunch? <laughs> Tacos. <laughs> what advice would you give someone that wants to pursue a similar career? I would say just. Um, it's good to take advice from people, but don't always listen to everything. You know, if you have a if you have an idea of something and you're driven towards something, you should, you know, whether it's a whether it's an idea or a story or something, you should. If that's what you feel like you should do, you should go and try that, and don't let people sway you. I guess sometimes you do have to listen to people, but uh, don't yeah, let them sway I think, you. you know, out of yeah, it. under you know, have have your people who you go to for advice and ask for the advice of people who sort of whose contexts and sensibilities you understand. Mm-hmm. Because you may not agree with them, but at least you'll understand where they're coming from. Uh, I've seen so many people who just sort of get spun around because they ask for advice from everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, I think on our last two movies, we, we've gone to like less than 10 people for, for notes on a movie. You just mm-hmm. go to the people who you trust. You can send a cutout to 100 people. You're going to get 100 sets of notes back yeah. and you'll get spun out. Yeah, I think there's also a tendency for people sometimes, especially in the notes process, where they're like, oh, well, they're asking for notes, so I'm just going to give notes. And, like, if you start taking all those notes, you get, like, a real— you can get yourself into that situation where, yeah, all of a sudden, two months down the line, you look at the draft, and you're like, it's just, it's like this Frankenstein thing thing that's not going to work. Like, you're the one who has to go shoot it. You know, you took someone else's idea, and now you're responsible for it. Um, You know, I think it's the the thing of, like, every indie movie, not every, like, half the, you know, the majority of indie movies that— I've I've seen you have this this thing where they they shoot and then someone's like, hey, South by Southwest is coming up. It doesn't matter if you submit a final cut, just submit a rough cut. And then someone rushes to get a cut done in six weeks. Can't cut a movie in six weeks. Then mm-hmm. that cut's done. That cut gets sent to South by. South by is like, what the hell is this? It's a terrible cut. Mm-hmm. Movie gets kicked back. Then they send it out to 100 people to get those notes. And then they end up, yeah. you know, a year later, the cut's done. Whereas like, I think our last two movies, we've been able to sort of just say, hey, we're taking three or four months to cut it, not Mm -hmm. showing it to anyone. We'll take some notes when it's done, but then it kind of just is what it is. You know, you have to to give yourself time to execute your own ideas before you take it out to Mm -hmm. to a committee. Because no, half the people who give notes don't even really care. They're like, you know, you'll like take someone's note and then talk to them later. I'm like, hey, we don't really feel on that note. And they're like, oh yeah, I don't know. It's just like... Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was something to say. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. I didn't really care. And you're like, oh, great. I spent you know, a week doing a rewrite because of this note you gave me. Yeah, I didn't even like care. you said, they see the opportunity to give notes, so they do that. Yeah. It's like, I mean, we've been on calls. You're like on a conference call with, you know, some company, and there could be like multiple people in there. And then there's always like someone who will like try to just throw something in at the end. And you're like, huh? Because <laughs> they want to throw one thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We've been in rooms like that before. We saw a guy get reprimanded hard once. We won't say where we were. <laughs> it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> I felt bad for him. It was like some intern or something, and he decided to just be like, and what if this happened? And the guy just looked at him. He was like, I forget what he said to him, but he was just like, no. No. And it was just like, oh. And then the next meeting we went to next week, that guy, we I've, never I've saw never, him again. He never saw fired. that guy again. He blew it. He was he was he was stepping up with the big boys. He couldn't do it anyway. But you know, I feel like for first, especially like first time filmmakers, care too much about resolution. Six K doesn't matter. Mm, yeah. Shooting four K, it's fine. If you're shooting a movie, 
4K is great just because it meets most of the delivery standards. Shooting in a 12-bit format actually matters because it gives you color depth uh, when you're when you're going into final color correction. Uh, you don't want to shoot on 8-bit. 10-bit's also fine, but your bit rate matters much more than your resolution. Joe is going into serious cinematographer yeah, mode. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I remember when, when like HD first came out, you, you walk into a Best Buy and there'd be the HD TV next to like the little SD square TV. And they'd be like, look at the difference. When 4K came out, you never saw the HD TV next to the 4K TV because it doesn't look that different. What talent, like we all have talents that are not related with our job, but they contribute a lot to our job. So do you have any talents that are super useful for what you do? I don't know if I do. Yeah. Everyone's always like, well, what are your hobbies? I'm like, I don't, I don't have hobbies. I have pretty low <laughs> self-esteem, so I don't, know if it's the right, I don't know if it's the right question for me. <laughs> what, uh, movies, what movies influence you guys? I think if I look back, I think there's a couple movies that I, that I think about that influence me and that I had never seen anything like them before at the time. One of them was um, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. I remember seeing that when I was like 10 or 11. And that, like, blew my mind. I, I guess even just that genre, like the English gangster, you know, movie, I'd seen, like, The Godfather, and that's, like, one way, and I thought that's what a gangster movie was, and I saw that, and it was, like, it was funny and irreverent, and it kind of, and it was it was violent, and it had everything, and um, that for sure was one that stuck out to me, where I was like, wow, you can make a movie like that. For me, I mean, I know, it's a little kid, I, mean, I, I forget how old I was when Fargo came out, but, you know, I, I, I always, like, growing up movies. I remember like, all right, but one of my friends' mom, I think I was over at a friend's house and I'm talking about how I really wanted to go see Fargo. My mom comes to pick me up and my other lady pulls her face like, hey, you know, he like wants to see this like movie where a guy gets put in a wood chipper. Yeah. And I was he's like, he's yeah. 11. And I'm like, yeah, it's just like, what, I don't know, it's just like was appealing to me at the time, you know? So yeah. I, you know, I'd watch like kids' movies at the time and I wouldn't feel anything. Mm-hmm. But as a little kid, you could watch like an adult movie and you'd really like feel something. I remember, uh, it was back back when they used to have uh, tapes at the library. You could go to the library, and I remember I'd go to the library with my mom and be like, hey, I'm going to, like, rent a movie from a library. But she's like, oh, it's it's from a library. How bad could it be? <laughs> I, I got aliens from the library, and her being, like, must have been, like, 9 or 10. I'm, like, watching it by myself at night, like, hiding behind the couch because <laughs> I like, was, like, very scared of it. But, like, being just absolutely, like, floored by what the movie was, you know, and, like— being able to feel that way. I was kind of shown a lot of stuff in my house when I was a kid, like you would like, like I guess, yeah, it, like not kids movies. So, yeah, I remember watching. Um, I would always watch Omega Man with Charlton Heston. That was another one where I was like, "Whoa, this this movie's wild, man!" I had never seen anything like that. As I as I got older and sort of you know you get used to what a movie is. I think I've always been real attracted to uh, Korean movies. I know Louis has too. You see like Old Boy and all those kinds of movies because. You get used to how a movie is told in sort of, to, you know, by a Hollywood production model, especially. So you have this classic three-act structure. So, I, you know, I found with Korean movies, whether, you know, it'll be one movie and then halfway through it flips the, the script and becomes a different movie and has these sort of insane violence. And it's so over the top that it, you know, has it has like some of that same visceral connection I had as a kid to watching adult movies when I watch. Yeah. A lot of stuff that gets made by a Korea, you know. Yeah, for and sure. I'm glad that Parasite kind of broke Korean movies for a larger American audience, but they've been making great stuff for a really yeah. long time. What filmmakers do you guys follow? I love the Coen brothers, you know. Like he was saying, Fargo is like one of my favorites. There's certain people, you know, if they make a movie, I'll go see it. If mm-hmm. Tarantino makes a movie, yeah, I'm always going to go see a Tarantino sure. movie. You're not going to not see it. Yeah. It's a weird thing. I, I think I, I went through periods of my life where I watched a lot of movies and— I think it's funny, if you ask my, I've been with my wife for five years, and I think if you asked her, does Joe watch a lot of movies? I think she would say no. It's because I've seen like a lot of the movies, you know, going back to like the 70s and stuff like that. It's like, that's sort of what my sweet spot of movies are. And I've seen mm-hmm. those movies now, you know? Yeah. Looking at like, you know, I love like Sam Peckinpah stuff, the uh, Wild Bunch, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of real, like, again, visceral in your face kind of 70s style of filmmaking. Yeah. It's really appealing. Um, where they kind of just went out and did it. If you couldn't uh, do movies, what would you be doing? I think I'd be a chef. Oh, really? Yeah. I like to cook. I've always thought it'd be fun to work for the CIA. I don't think it would be. I think it would probably no, be wow. boring. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I like traveling and like, I feel like, it's, I, feel like be, I feel like it's a lot, a lot of travel, like data analytics and stuff like that, which I kind of like. I think it'd be cool. You, usually people take like a while to answer this question, yeah. but you yeah. guys were like, 
That would be yeah. a chef. We're ready. Yeah, we're ready to change <laughs> jobs if this doesn't work out. CIA agent. We're ready for our exit plan. <laughs> Cut my papers in over at Langley. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I would love to know someone who is in the CIA to, like, help me out. So That, that would be me. I'm down. That's what I'm saying. I'm down. Yeah, you guys have never talked about this before? I think. I don't know if we have. I've told you that before. You told me you want to be in the CIA? Yeah. And he's cooked you something? Yeah. He's cooked for me, too. This guy cooks, too. You okay. know? What do you guys make? Uh, uh, I like to do a lot of um, meats. I've been really into, uh, you want me to get specific on this? I've been really into uh, cooking stuff on a cast iron pan lately. No desserts? I'm not a big dessert person. I don't know how to make desserts. My wife will make sometimes stuff, but, you know, like out of the box. You can make cast iron desserts. Uh, oh, yeah, like um, uh, like turnover cake, like that kind Absolutely. of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. Chocolate do you do chip that? Do you guys cookie. do that? No, <laughs> not at all. You should do it for us. Uh, I'll bring it in. We'll <laughs> That'd do be great. Show. <laughs> well, you guys have given some very... Uh, enlightening answers. Obviously, you wear a lot of hats. You do a lot of jobs on your sets. Uh, so, you know, we appreciate all the input. We could probably do a whole podcast series on these guys as filmmakers. <laughs> totally. We could have a cooking show. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just audio. Just on audio <laughs> cooking. <You> can, like, <laughs> That's a terrible oh. idea. Or a CIA show. Yeah. I don't really I know it. anything about it, though, is the thing. I feel like I, I might, like, actually just not like it at all. You're going you're gonna to take your hands dirty. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Well, that's it. I think oh, that's we're enough. Done. Yeah, we okay. have enough. Any parting thank words? Thank you so much. Um, cut, action. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's all good, sir. Hollywood Rising is produced by Tim Tuchrello and LNA. Sound mixer, Mike Shu. Music by Jonathan Byron. Special thanks to Kami Asgar, Richard Burnett, Sam Fan, and Brian Wessel. This is a Sputnik Media production in association with Mr. 101 Productions. He's Mr. 101.